Merci. All right. Well, as you can see, I have enough questions to keep you here until midnight, maybe sometime after. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I just quickly scan through the first group that I can scan through in six minutes. And uh, we are going to, the rest of these we're going to categorize, we're going to try to put them together, and then we'll find another way for you to get answers from these gentlemen. So we'll, uh, we'll probably post some of the questions and their answers online if they're willing to answer these questions for us. I'm going to take a few questions. We have about 18 minutes, so that's what I'd like to do. And we're going to uh, have you leave at 8.30. And at 8.30, we're going to invite these gentlemen out in the narthex, and you can stay and visit with them. I would encourage you when you visit with them, don't monopolize their time, because there'll be other people waiting to talk to them. You probably won't get these questions answered when you visit with them in the, in the narthex. Uh, Reverend Awad has a book that he's written that is an excellent book. I've, I've read it. Uh, he has 10 copies here, so he'll be signing those 10 copies. <laughs> and uh, Rabbi Cohen has no book, but he's going to be out offering blessings and, and uh, greetings in the narthex as well. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we're going to jump in with these, uh, with these questions. And uh, I'm going to start with the questions people have submitted, and if uh, these don't get at some of the other questions I have, I'll answer these, ask these as well. This is for you, Reverend Awad. About 10 years ago, uh, this person writes, the Israelis offered nearly every, uh, I can't read what the word is, but in essence agreed to concessions to the Palestinians, and, uh, and it looked as though there was an agreement. This is during Clinton's time. Yes. It looked as though there was an agreement, and then that fell through, which sounded like, and certainly listening to Israelis, it sounded like the best chance for peace, and it looked as though that the Palestinians really sabotaged this. Can you speak to this, please? Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, someone asked this question, because um, I took uh, four groups of United Methodist bishops to visit Yasser Arafat when he was still alive. And, uh, you know, these groups of United Methodist bishops like to meet with the Israelis and Palestinian leaders. And so I, I was like the catalyst. And so after many questions and answers, I asked Yasser Arafat the same question. I said, uh, Mr. President, when I go to the United States, people ask me, why did you throw away the chance for peace uh, at Camp David? when uh, you, Barack, and Bill Clinton were together trying to make peace. Why, why did you throw it away? So, yes, Arafat just laughed, you know, a big laugh, and he said, listen, let me tell you. He said, we agreed on most points. I was willing to sign on most points. But when it came to Jerusalem, it was difficult, because this is what Yasser Arafat told me. He said, Barack said to me, the Al-Aqsa Mosque or Haram al-Sharif or what we call sometimes the Temple Mount, you know, where the Muslims have uh, the, their uh, holy mosque. Uh, so Barak said to Yasser Arafat, the building belongs to you, Palestinians. You can have the building. But the sky above it and the ground under it belongs to us, Israelis. Well, Yasser Arafat, said, okay, let me ask my colleagues in the Arab world what they think about this. So he called Hosni Barak, at that time he was president of Egypt, and he called, you know, the guy from Tunisia, and he called the guy from Syria, and he called all the Arab countries, and he said, this is what they are offering me. The building is ours, the sky is not ours, and the earth is not ours. What do you think? Would you accept it? And he said to us, you know, to the bishops, and including myself, he said, all of them, all of them said, no, we would not sign an agreement like that. And that's why it failed. It failed over the territory which we call Al-Aqsa Mosque. Because Yasser Arafat said, what would happen if there is an earthquake or some crazy fanatic will burn the buildings? Then we cannot build because the earth is not ours and the sky is not ours. And that's one reason it failed. There are other reasons, but I cannot go into more details. All right. uh, Rabbi Cohen, uh, this question I'm going to address your way. Uh, when President Obama asked Israel a couple of months ago to pull back to pre-1967 positions, uh, what do you want us to know about this, and was this realistic? And if not, why not? Uh, yes, I think it was realistic. Uh, it also was nothing really different than any of the President Obama's predecessors had really called for. 
It was the way, I think, in which it was called for by President Obama, uh, the uh, very explicit nature of it. But what was overlooked was the fact that along with that statement was that to pull back to the 1967 boundaries and then to discuss the territorial concessions that would be necessary in order to make for a viable set of boundaries between Israel and the Palestinian state. That latter part of it seems to have been overlooked by a lot of people. Jewish people, media people, a whole series of people. Uh, they focused only on the part, pull back to the 67 boundaries. And uh, I disagree with those who took the position, including those in the Israeli government, who focused only on that first part and said it's untenable. I don't know if it's untenable, I'm not a military expert, but I do know that the statement was more than just pull back. There was to be negotiated settlement, territorial settlements, uh, land issues that were to be worked out. It's a little bit, I like to uh, think of it oftentimes like the, the rabbinic phrase uh, that uh, when Hillel, the sage, was approached by the Gentile and asked to explain the entire Torah on one foot, uh, he did so by saying you should love your neighbor as yourself. And people focus only on that part and forget about the fact that Hillel also said, the rest is commentary, now go and learn it. Uh, it's a little bit like the second part of it. Okay, there's a commentary that needs to be learned. So I really did not find the president's statement uh, offensive, uh, nor necessarily an impediment to peace. Thank you. This question is for you, Reverend Um uh, Israel redrew... Uh, the uh, withdrew, excuse me, from Gaza and abandoned uh, beautiful farms and agriculture, and the situation only got worse. Uh, how would you respond to that? Why? And really, the question went on: Why should uh, Israel trust and do this again by giving up settlements? Well, the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza was like a bad divorce. You know, the Israelis decided to leave Gaza unilaterally. This means they refused to negotiate with the Palestinians. They decided this is what we want to do and we do it the way we want to. So there was no agreement with the Palestinians as regarding as Israel's withdrawal from Gaza. It's like a terrible, terrible divorce. Have the Israelis come to the Palestinian uh, authority? Have, have they sat with the Palestinians, not even as equals, you know, even as lords and slaves? Have they sat with the Palestinians? then the withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza would have uh, happened in a very gentle and humane way, and the Palestinians would have uh, appreciated that approach. But for the Israelis to refuse to, uh, to negotiate with the Palestinians, to do a unilateral withdrawal without negotiation with the Palestinians created um, a, a bitter feeling among the Palestinians. Rabbi, I sense you want to respond to that in some uh, I, do. Uh, I have great deal of respect for Reverend Awad, but I think that that's really, uh, really a distortion uh, of, the, of the facts, a great deal of distortion, and an overlooking of a very basic fact, that a large part of the Gaza Strip was in the hands of a group that would not sit down with Israel, even if Israel had said, we'll sit down and negotiate with you. Now, Hamas is not prepared to talk to Israel. So it, it really seems as if what's being said here is, we want you out, we want you out, we want you out. So okay, we'll leave. And now when you leave, we don't like the way you're leaving. And I'm not sure that you can have it both ways. Uh, Israel was, was asked, not nicely, to leave. Uh, Israel withdrew from Lebanon after the incursion there uh, and a great deal of pressure brought to bear and a lot of uh, incidents and a lot of uh, soldiers dying in the course and so forth. Israel pulled out and again, uh, it was uh, immediately, Israel didn't do it in the right way. Israel should have sat down and negotiated. And I, I think that one is asking somewhat the impossible of the Israeli government. And that is to sit down and negotiate all the time with parties like Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza who are not prepared to talk to Israel, not prepared to even recognize Israel. So why should Israel make an effort to negotiate with them? Israel pulled out, and uh, those in control of the Gaza really ran that ground into the ground, literally. This seems to make some sense, what uh, Rabbi Cohen is saying. And uh, I'd like to ask your uh, Hamas's refusal to 
Is it an absolute refusal to negotiate with Israel, or is it an absolute refusal to recognize the state of Israel, or is it conditional? Can you help us understand, I know you're not a part of Hamas, but help us understand uh, this part of it. Well, you're right. I'm not part of Hamas, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not an advocate for Hamas, but you need to understand what is happening in Gaza. There are one 1.6 million Palestinians living in utter poverty in Gaza. 70% of those people are refugees from what we call today Israel. They ran away, They're, they left their homes, their farms, and they became the population of Gaza. Yes, they are radical, yes, they are violent, but their radicality and their violence is due to all the happenings that happened to them. Israel has no business to occupy Gaza in the first place. You don't go to a small place with 1.5 million people and occupy it and be a lord over these people. So Israel did itself a favor when it moved out of Gaza. Believe me. Israel was not trying to do favor to the Palestinians who were in Gaza. And what the Palestinians in Gaza, whether they are Hamas or Fatah or any party, wanted, they wanted a negotiation that will include the whole Palestinian territories. They want a negotiation that includes the West Bank. What Israel did is threw Gaza out of the political equation. That was what Sharon wanted. He wanted to throw Gaza out of the political situation. He did not want 1.6 million Palestinians to be controlled by Israel. If Israel will withdraw from the West Bank, I have a feeling with negotiations, with real, genuine negotiations, we will not see a Hamas-like government in the West Bank. What's it take for Hamas to recognize Israel? Would they ever, regardless of the negotiations that happen with the Palestinian Authority or the Fatah? Another good question. Another good question. Where is Hamas as far as the negotiations? Well, you see, you need to, to be listening to what Hamas leaders are saying. And this is what they are saying. If the secular party, which is the PLO, the Fatah group, Mahmoud Abbas government, if they negotiate with Israel on behalf of all the Palestinians, and the Palestinian people are accepting those negotiations, Hamas will go along. This is Hamas's official position. So if this happened in this way, and Israel was recognized, Hamas would recognize Israel? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I want to ask you, Rabbi Cohen, one of the things that has uh, disturbed me is when I've traveled through the West Bank with, uh, with Palestinian Christians, in the West Bank, this isn't in Israel, but in the West Bank, and we're stopped at checkpoints, and there's 45 minutes. That I get to ride my car and pass right through, and the Palestinian Christian, my guide, will spend 45 minutes going through security inside the West Bank, not between West Bank and Israel. Or when uh, most recently we were in, in Hebron, and uh, and to watch, you know, the Palestinian Christians we were with be harassed by Israeli soldiers, uh, made to feel like second-class citizens in their own country, which is already second-class. It seems very hard to figure out how there's peace, or even how that looks faithful to the call of God upon the, uh, the Jewish people. Help us understand how this changes. Well, I'll go back to what I said uh, really in my first part of the presentation. Uh, the fact that that's almost asking for a black and white response. Uh, a good guy, bad guy, justice, injustice response. And I'm not sure that, that really is possible to be done in a real world. In an ideal world, yes. And should we, I hope, someday reach that point without question. But the fact is that in a real world, sometimes, I don't want to say indignities have to be brought upon people or injustices, because I really see there, I, I don't see any basis for either the indignities or the injustices. And when they occur, I think they should be stopped. And they have occurred, and, and certainly, uh, some of the things, making, making some of the people who come to the checkpoints uh, to go through a search process that really is an indignity, a human indignity, uh, is, is not necessary, it's not appropriate. 
But I think that the very basis from which what you're describing, uh, the principle from which it starts, is the fact that Israel has a responsibility to guarantee the security of her citizens. And in the opinion of the government, that is being done by saying that those who come through checkpoints, who enter Israel from the West Bank, who go, however, maybe moving about through checkpoints, there, is, there may be questions of security involved, and if those questions of security are involved, you, Everett Adam, Adam Hamilton, an American citizen driving through, there's no, there's no concern or issue, but somebody who lives in the West Bank, there may be a concern about associations this person has. Maybe they're, un, maybe they're not just, but the fact is that there is this overriding concern. Uh, the same concern that I think um, has, a, has been applied in other places in the world uh, where we have, and, I, and I'm certainly not endorsing any kind of profiling because I think that racial profiling is wrong and ethnic profiling is wrong, but uh, when people travel from areas of known terror into other areas, uh, the countries into which they are, are coming have the right to em employ certain uh, guarantees of safety and security for the citizens. I don't think we would want known Al-Qaeda operatives to come into this country without some kind of, of, of effort being put forth to, to check them out, to keep them out if necessary. And I think that Israel approaches it in the same way. Again, injustices occur? Absolutely. Should those injustices take place? Never. But sometimes in the enthusiasm of, of fulfilling the law, the rule, the case, uh, some people may be exuberant in their behavior. That needs to be stopped, and occasionally it is stopped, but it certainly has happened. And I would never make an excuse for it, other than the fact to say that I think that there is a necessity to employ rules if one wants to guarantee the security of, of the citizens. And Israel knows from actual facts that terrorists have come into the country through various points, have blown up civilians, stores, markets, neighborhoods, and wants to make sure that doesn't happen again. I think most of us understand if you're moving, say, from the United States, you're flying somewhere else, you go through the checks at the security and people coming in and out. I think where it's confusing is when this happens inside the West Bank territory, not going from West Bank into... And there it begins to feel, uh, granted the, uh, the statements as you uh, made a moment ago, uh, made clear a moment ago, feel inflammatory and, and unhelpful, but it begins to feel much more like an apartheid-type state inside the West Bank when this happens. What I think is, is to be viewed and understood is that while you're making a very clear statement about within the West Bank, the fact is that the areas are very fluid and that Israel feels if it does not employ certain security measures even within the checkpoints in the West Bank, it's very possible for people to move through those areas and because of the fluidity of, of, of areas of boundary of division, find themselves perhaps with, with malice intent crossing over into Israel, Israeli territory. I want to ask you, Reverend Alon, the violence. I mean, how do we understand and make sense of the violence and how does it stop? Because it, it appears as though the violent resistance or however it would be described among Palestinians has actually hurt the Palestinian people far more than it has than it has actually brought help to them. How does this stop? The the security wall was was a way of stopping this. What does it take for the Palestinian people to say this is a failed strategy and our approach must be something more like Dr. King's approach in uh, in nonviolent resistance? Well, as a matter of fact, now most Palestinians have opted for the nonviolence way of resisting the occupation. Uh, there are now non-violent groups all over the Palestinian territories. Even my nephew, Sami Awad, he is one of the leaders of uh, the non-violent movements in the West Bank. And, you know, uh, of course I have a different perspective from uh, uh, Rabbi Cohen, but the wall did not stop the violence. The violence stopped because the Palestinians came to the conclusion that killing Israelis, killing men, women, and children in the streets of Jerusalem or uh, Yaffa or Tel Aviv is not the answer. 
Right now, at least 40,000 Palestinians illegally cross from the West Bank into Israel. And if these people want to do violence, they can do it any time. But they don't. And the reason they don't is because the Palestinian people decided those days of suicide bombing are gone and they don't want them anymore. So I, I'm glad for that. I'm glad that the Palestinians reached the maturity that uh, violence will not work. But is Israel now responding? The Palestinians are now reaching out to Israel with non-violence. Are the Israeli leaders saying, yes, we will uh, grab the opportunity and we will meet the Palestinians. And the Palestinian president, who is totally committed to non-violence, the Israeli prime minister, by the way, he came to our crisis at the checkpoint conference and he gave a speech. It was totally dedicated to non-violence. He told us Palestinians, non-violence is the only way we can get our way in this world. And also I would like to say to Rabbi Cohen, we have five Israelis speaking at the Christ at the checkpoint conference, Israeli Jews who spoke at the Christ at the checkpoint. So uh, some of you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about Christ at the checkpoint. Bethlehem Bible College held a conference in Bethlehem with the title Christ at the checkpoint. And our hope and desire was to say if Jesus Christ would come to this country, if he would see the checkpoint and the watchtowers and uh, all of uh, uh, these injustices, how would Christ feel? What would Christ do? How would Christ forgive? We wanted to learn from Jesus if he would be in our situation. And uh, we decided it's not going to be only Palestinians speaking. We have Palestinians, we have international speakers from all over the world, but we have also five Israeli Jewish speakers because we wanted balance. And we thank God, they came, and we gave them the freedom to speak their heart out without any reservation. Thank you. Uh, our time is up, but I have one last question I need to ask, and I'm actually going to ask it of you because you've already addressed the topic. And we have uh, several hundred people now, I think, who are watching online. Many of them who are delegates to our United Methodist General Conference here in, uh, starting next week. And one of the petitions that comes before the General Conference of 2,000 petitions is divestiture in the companies that are doing business with the settlements in the West Bank. And you've made very clear why you feel like that's a, a not a good idea. And so I want to give you a chance, uh, Reverend Awad, to respond. What would you say to those delegates about the settlement? Well, the peace movement around the world is seeking ways to stop the occupation. And they are seeking non-violent ways to stop the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. And they are trying to tell the Palestinians, you can be liberated, but try to think of non-violence. So we are asking the international community, okay, how are you going to do it? One of the ideas is to divest from Israeli companies that are encouraging the occupation of the West Bank. So we are not saying divestment means to divest from all Israeli companies or all, all, all Israeli commercial ties and so on. We are focusing on companies that are supporting the occupation. And we are saying these companies should be boycotted. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, one afternoon, one of my students, his name is Tony, I'm a teacher at a Bible college. Tony called me and he said, Reverend Awad, my land is being taken over by Israeli settlers. The bulldozers are in my land. Please, please come and help me. Well, I thought, well, I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher at a Bible college. I'm not even a politician. And I don't have any weapons. How can I help you? Well, I could not say no. So I called my cousin, a lawyer, Jonathan Kutab, and the next day, about four or five of us went to the land, and sure enough, the bulldozers, you know, were digging in the land, in Tony's land, and his family, and they were trying to confiscate that land and make it a new Jewish settlement. So we spoke with the people, we said, please stop bulldozing. 
the land. This is not your land. We showed them the paper. We showed them the deeds. They said, no, no, God gave us the land. Well, how can you argue with the person who tells you that God gave me the land? <laughs> so it was very difficult for us. <clears throat> then Jonathan decided, okay, there's only one way to stop them. And he went and stood in front of the caterpillar, in front of the bulldozer. And we had no choice but to stop with him. I was terrified. I'm not used to this kind of non-climate <laughs> resistance. But we did. We did. Finally, they stopped. And the police came. And the police said, all right, you, you two groups, bring your papers, the title for the land, and tomorrow we'll have discussion. So tomorrow, the next day, we brought our papers. Because the people have their papers. They need for the land. The other group don't have any papers. So they didn't show up the next day. Thank goodness, we won the battle. But here's the problem. We are saying to the Caterpillar Company, don't be used as a tool of injustice in the Holy Land. And if you continue, we will divest. So these are the companies that we are targeting for uh, divestment. Uh, companies that are supporting the takeover of Palestinian land illegally. Okay. I give you one minute response. Okay. I, only because and I don't have the time to read the entire letter, but there's a letter that has been drafted and signed by hundreds of rabbis. And I'm proud to be one of those uh, signatories to this letter. A, a letter from the American rabbis to our Christian neighbors regarding divestment proposals. And I just want to read a little portion of that letter. It's not a long letter, but just a portion of it. We, the undersigned rabbis, reach out in hope to our Christian friends and neighbors. We have close relationships deeply treasured and shaped over many years. We are partners on many social issues, including fostering peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Any place in which a single human being suffers, we all suffer. We understand and respect your calling to invest in a morally responsible manner. Invest in a morally responsible manner. A policy of divestment to pressure Israel runs counter to these goals. Such a one-sided approach damages the relationship between Jews and Christians that has been nurtured for decades. For Jews, the use of economic leverages against the Jewish state is fraught with inescapable associations. They resonate in the Jewish consciousness with the historic boycotts against Jewish companies and the state of Israel. They, ex they are experienced by Jews as a part of a pattern of singling out Jews for attack. To determine and continue policies that knowingly tap into the deepest fears and pain of another is, in our tradition, a serious failure of relationship. At a time when politics in general have become so divisive, here and abroad, our efforts should be, should be aimed toward reconciliation. Together and independently, Christians, Jews, and Muslims must give the parties to the conflict the confidence they need to work toward peace. There are many meaningful coexistence programs that can foster a generation of Israelis and Palestinians that will work and live side by side. And the letter goes on for a couple more paragraphs. But that letter, I think, reflects what the attitude is of the American Jewish opinion, particularly the rabbinic opinion in this country, all across the board, reform, conservative, orthodox. There are those who have signed from all three primary branches of, of the Jewish world, saying to our Methodist and Presbyterian friends, please don't do this. It will only feed into, as I said earlier, really the arguments of extremism. It will not bring sides together. It will only bring people further apart and create even harder and, and uh, more, more uh, divisive uh, tactics to follow. Very good. This has been very helpful to hear eloquently spoken, the case for, the case against, uh, and basically we're talking about the monies that are invested in our United Methodist pension funds and other funds that are set aside by the denomination. Those are invested in a variety of tools, and the question is, do we continue to invest in these companies that are part of the uh, doing business in the West Bank and or continuing this activity in the West Bank? And you both made eloquent cases on your side. Thank you. Uh, I want us to have a chance to thank these folks, and then I'm going to ask if each of you would give a closing prayer for peace, and, uh, and then we'll escort you out while you all stay in your places so we can get them out the door first, and then you can greet them outside. So would you join me in thanking our two speakers for today?